was in an interesting session with one of our master technicians and a car salesman. The salesman, Bill Van, tries to learn all he can about the car he's selling. Bill says he's closed a lot of deals just because he could talk with authority and enthusiasm about our products. Whenever there is something he doesn't understand, he heads for the service department and Mike Porter. Mike is a first-class technician. He knows cars and what makes them go inside and out. And he's a swell fellow, too. Always willing to take time out to help someone else. When I got there, Mike had just finished a job, and Bill was Johnny on the spot to pick his brains a while before he started the next one. Say, Mike, how about a little schooling before you start something else? I need the whys on all the heavy-duty options listed in this folder. A lot of my customers and prospects want to load up their cars with all kinds of luggage and vacation gear. And they don't think anything of pulling a trailer that weighs as much as the car. But I have trouble explaining why they need heavy-duty equipment and what happens to the car if they don't order it. I can understand your problem, Bill. A lot of car troubles are caused by this kind of overloading. Maybe with tech's help, I can give you a few whys in a way that you can get them across to the customers. To start with, Bill, car suspension design is a compromise involving style, ride comfort, and load carrying capacity. Most of the cars you see are driven around with no load except the driver and maybe a passenger in the front seat. The car has to ride softly in this condition because everyone expects a soft ride nowadays. With a very light load in the car, a relatively low spring rate is needed for a smooth ride. So that's how our standard rear springs and front torsion bars are designed. Because of their relatively low rates, the springs and torsion bars are going to flex easily. That means that to get a smooth ride, the wheels need more jount space than if the springs were stiff. Now that fancy phrase, jount space, refers to how far the wheels can move up in relation to the car before the suspension bottoms on the rubber bumpers, Bill. When you start to load the car up, jount space is reduced as the springs compress. This means less spring motion is available to cushion road shocks. So the demand for a soft ride definitely limits load carrying capacity. But why not design more jump space into the car, Mike? Styling is the problem here, Bill. Car buyers are conditioned to low cars. We could have plenty of jump space if our cars were a foot higher. But then you'd have a tough time selling them. No doubt about that, Mike. Even with the compromises, Bill, our cars have better load-carrying ability than most. For instance, our standard sedans can carry up to six average people and about 200 pounds in the trunk comfortably. But if the car is going to be heavily loaded most of the time, the buyer should take a tip from cab owners. Order the heavy-duty spring option. Okay, Tech. I'll remember that. Remember this, too. The location of the load, as well as the amount of the load, has an important effect on ride, handling, and wear and tear on the car, Bill. For instance, filling up the back seat places the load ahead of the rear axle, so it's partially supported by the front torsion bars, and there isn't too much change in the car's attitude. But, see what happens with an overhanging load. A couple of hundred pounds in the trunk, way in the back of the axle causes a lever effect that lowers the rear more than if the load was over the axle. And it's worse in back of a station wagon because there's more overhang. Most people, when they're loading a wagon, will put the light things in first over the axle. The heaviest stuff goes way in the back. And notice sometime where all the luggage racks are placed, right at the rear. It gets even worse when a trailer is attached to a hitch, so all the load is behind the axle. In fact, the weight on the trailer ball can be the equivalent of twice the weight in the trunk. What it all adds up to, Bill, is that most car overloading is in back of the rear axle and causes a teeter-totter effect. The rear is lowered and the front is raised, so balance and stability are greatly reduced. Well, they sure are, Mike. Peculiar things happen to front suspension and steering geometry when the rear end is lowered and the front end is raised. That's an important point, Bill. You know how fussy we are about proper car attitude and front end height when we adjust caster, camber, and toe in. No load in the car except a full tank of gas. Yeah, I remember that, Mike. Well, raising the front end up 
can have weird effects on alignment and cause all sorts of problems like wander, hard steering, poor returnability, and even low speed shimmy. I refuse to tinker with the alignment specifications because that just makes it worse when the car is lightly loaded. That's quite an indictment against rear end overload, Mike. Is there more? There sure is, Bill. In the Hotchkiss drive rear suspension used on all our cars, the rear springs are used to drive the car and must handle all the acceleration and rear wheel braking torque. On breakaway, torque reaction causes the springs to wind up. If the car is overloaded, there will be more deflection and the springs may take a permanent set. This combination of static and torque loads tips the nose of the differential housing up. Often the bumper on the pinion carrier nose hits the body bracket. During acceleration on a washboard road, the bumper beats against the body like an air hammer. Then there is U-joint angularity. Angles change constantly, but a small amount of angularity is carefully designed into the drive line to minimize vibrations and brunelling of bearings. If you want to bone up on the technical explanation, you can read it in this reference book. The important point is, rear end lowering and spring windup cause undesirable changes to angularity and shutter and vibration result. And if the pinion carrier nose bumper is up against the body, the whole body becomes a sounding board for the noise. The noise isn't the worst part of it, though, Bill. It's the vibration that does the damage. I don't know of a better way to make a machine fail than to shake it apart. Tech's right there, Bill. I might add that the next best way to fail any machine is to overload it. Do you think that's reason enough to sell a heavy-duty option for heavy loading? It sure is, Mike. Let's see if I got the story straight now. Springs have to have a relatively low rate for riding comfort when the car is unloaded. And since there isn't much room for upward wheel movement in today's low-slung cars, load capacity is definitely limited. Some of the problems of overloading the rear springs are incorrect car attitude resulting in instability and handling difficulty, increased spring wind-up which can cause early failure, bottoming on bumps, and driveline vibration, which is irritating and also can cause premature failure. That about summarizes it, Bill. Heavy-duty springs won't ride so softly when the car is lightly loaded, but they certainly should be ordered if the car is going to be driven most of the time with heavy loads. Can't the heavy-duty springs be installed here in the shop if they're not ordered with the car? They can, Bill, but it's not too practical. If it was just a matter of installing stiffer rear springs, I'd say why not? But to give the best ride and handling characteristics, the heavy-duty factory option also includes heavy-duty torsion bars and shock absorbers, and in some models, a sway eliminator. So, to get all the right parts and the correct adjustments, factory installation is best. Well, why are these other parts needed? The parts that go into the option are matched for the best combination of ride, appearance, and load-carrying ability, Bill. For one thing, the balance between front and rear spring rates is very important. If the proper balance between spring rates isn't maintained, the car tends to pitch as it goes over bumps. Also, if a car is loaded properly, some of the extra weight will be transferred to the front end, and extra support may be needed there. Okay, that's understandable. What about shock absorbers, though? They don't have anything to do with supporting weight. Before we get into that, let's get someone to turn the record over. You're right, Bill, that shock absorbers don't support any of the load. Their purpose is simply to control ride motion. But to control the motion properly, the shock absorber has to be matched to the spring rate. That's one reason we use only original equipment shocks for replacement here. Good for you, Mike. I'll bet you don't bury the live widow with her dead husband either, do you? <laughs> no, Tech. We don't replace shocks in pairs unnecessarily. We know that their performance never changes unless they break or leak. So if only one shock fails, that's all we replace. We just make sure the part number is the same as the original. One thing we do install here in the shop, Bill, are Mopar load leveler shocks. These have auxiliary springs to help support the load and are good for moderate loading. But for real heavy duty, it's best to order the factory package. Okay, Mike, I understand that now. How about some of these other items? Take torque flight, for instance. 
Some people who've driven competitors' automatics really question this as a heavy-duty transmission. And I'm not too convinced about it myself. Let's get one thing straight, Bill. There's a lot of difference between our torque flight and most other automatics, particularly for heavy-duty operation. The A727 torque flight is built to handle the output of our biggest engines. And speaking of engines, don't sell your customer a boy for a man-sized job. No one should ever be allowed to buy a six-cylinder engine if he wants to haul a two-ton trailer cross-country. When we talk about heavy-duty, we're talking about V8 power. With an eight, the customer gets a heavy-duty rear axle. And if he buys torque flight, the heavy-duty A727 model. The A727 torque flight is a real heavy-duty unit. It has big clutch and band areas and big bearings. It's built to handle a load, and it's water-cooled to prevent overheating. Lo load hauling ability is only part of the story, Mike. The operation of the torque flight is what makes it so much better than other transmissions. Right, Tech. Torque flight is a three-speed automatic, and it always starts in low gear. With the added converter ratio, this means maximum torque for breakaway and load pulling. The converter actually adds several advantages. By giving more torque multiplication in the transmission, less is necessary in the rear axle. So you can have good performance with a numerically lower axle ratio with torque flight, and this is good for highway driving and highway economy. The converter also cushions shock loads, so there's less shock in the drive line. Automatic selection of the correct gear ratio is another advantage of torque flight. It takes the human factor out, and the engine is always permitted to run at the most efficient speed. But when the driver wants to exercise control, it's as simple as pushing a button. The number two button prevents upshifting to high gear, and the number one button prevents upshifting to intermediate. This is where the superiority of push-button torque flight over manual shift really shows up. For heavy-duty operation, there are plenty of conditions when it is desirable to use the lower ratios. For instance, coming down the mountain, the number one range gives you maximum engine braking. This is a safety factor as well as preventing wear and tear on the brakes. Hold it just a minute, fellas. You're talking as if it's perfectly okay to run around in lower intermediate gear. I've always been taught this is no good for the transmission or the engine. That's true with standard transmissions, Bill. In low or intermediate, you don't have much gear tooth contact, and gear action causes side loading on the shafts. They're just not designed for continuous low or second gear operation. Planetary gears, though, are designed for extended operation in low or intermediate. With torque flight, you have big, husky planetary gears with much more tooth contact. And unlike a standard transmission, there are no side loads. So low or intermediate gear operation isn't harmful to torque flight. And in fact, helps cool the transmission and engine. How's that, Mike? More use of the gears for multiplication instead of the converter keeps the transmission cooler. And the higher engine speed cools the engine, Bill. I take it then that cooling can be a problem with heavy-duty operation, Mike. It sure can, Bill. Heavy-duty operation means much higher demands on the engine's cooling system. For moderate loads, a high-capacity fan and 16 PSI radiator cap are recommended. In addition, for heavy loads or with a lot of hill climbing, the heavy-duty air conditioning type radiator and fan shroud are needed. This is another option that should be ordered from the factory. Tires and wheels are pretty important, too, for carrying heavy loads. The danger of failure is increased with loading. So our safety rim wheels are a comforting feature. How does loading cause tire failure, Mike, by increasing the pressure? Gosh, no, Bill. In fact, when a car is heavily loaded, you should increase the tire pressure four pounds to reduce the tread contact area. Now, say that once in American, will you? It's like this, Bill. All the load supported by the tire is concentrated on the actual tread area in contact with the ground. Any change in the load or the tire pressure will change this contact area. A heavier load causes this area to spread out. The effect is the same as an underinflated tire. It runs a little flat. Not only will this cause more tread wear, but there will be abnormal sidewall flexing which generates heat. Increasing tire pressure 
but not more than four extra pounds partially compensates for the extra load. Tire inflation is a story in itself, Bill. For instance, pressure builds up as a tire heats, and it shouldn't be bled. The complete story is here in the reference book. You can have this copy. Thanks, Tech. I'll be sure to read it. Extra air in the tires isn't a cure-all. For heavy duty, you may need bigger tires. So be sure to check what the recommended option is and order it with the car. Can't you take care of that here in the shop, Mike? No. There are problems with oversized tires, too, Bill. For instance, you may not have enough wheel opening. Speedometer error may result. And usually, the wheels have to be changed with the tires. I understand about wheel opening and speedometer error. But what's this about changing wheels, Mike? As the tire sizes get larger, the rim width also gets wider. If too narrow a wheel is used, the sidewalls won't be straight and the tire will flex and heat up. You might as well not have changed the tire in that case. There just isn't any easy way to make a truck out of a passenger car, Bill. If your customer really needs a truck, maybe you would better sell him a Dodge pickup or town wagon instead of a car. Tex, right again, Bill, but few cars can do as good a job of doubling for a truck as ours if the proper options are included. But you have to get the equipment when the car is ordered, rather than try to rebuild it in the field. There are some other options we haven't had time to cover today, Bill. For instance, the need for more braking power with heavier loads should be obvious. We have heavy-duty brakes and power brake options described here in Tech's reference book, along with power steering, sure grip differential, and others. The book has a section on trailer hauling and trailer hitches, and why hitches shouldn't be attached to the bumper or suspension components, but rather to the heavy framing members. There's also an illustration of a load equalizing hitch that transfers some of the load to the front suspension. You know, Bill, Understanding heavy-duty operation and heavy-duty options is mighty important. You sell them right, Mike and the service department will keep your customers satisfied with the cars you sell. Now just one last thing. Why don't you men out there take a tip from Mike and Bill? Keep the sales and service teamwork clicking in your dealership. <laughs>